So my really, my principal motivation for writing this book grew out of my work as a public defender. And there's a lot of, there's history and there's argument in this book, but fundamentally in a lot of ways it is a book of stories. And one of the stories that I tell early on in the book is of a young man that I represented by the name of Brandon. And Brandon was a teenage client of mine, Washington, D.C. I was his public defender appointed to represent him and defend him in criminal court. He had been charged with possession of a gun, possession of a small amount of marijuana, $15, $20 worth. And he had pled guilty. He was facing sentencing. And I had taken the job of being his lawyer because I viewed it the work of criminal defense as the civil rights work of my generation. My parents met in SNCC. They met in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is one of the major civil rights organizations in the 1960s uh, in the United States. And my father was the executive secretary of that organization. My mother was a member of the organization. And they were an interracial couple. My dad is black, my mom is white. They were an interracial couple at a time when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. This country, in my country, in the United States. <laughs> And that generation, that generation really changed, changed America, right? Theirs was the generation that fought and produced the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. These are the major pieces of legislation that, that transformed race uh, in America. But at the same time, it was clear to me that although they had changed the possibilities, the life possibilities of so many people, right? I had opportunities that were unimaginable to a black man of my father's generation, growing up as he did in de jure segregated Mississippi, de facto segregated Chicago. It was clear that there was a lot of unfinished business in the civil rights movement. And the place where I saw that unfinished business manifesting itself most pervasively was the criminal legal system. By the 1990s, right, we didn't even have the term mass incarceration yet. That was a term that was created in the year 2000. But we already knew that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision. We already knew that we didn't have figures for black women, but, but along the same lines, but we knew from that same report from the sentencing project in the early 1990s that black women were the largest single growing portion of the prison population in the United States. We already knew, it was already true by the mid 90s that the United States had passed Russia and South Africa to become the world's largest jailer. 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners. These were all things that were true by the 90s. And that reality drew me to want to be a public defender. I had seen some of it in my own life. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, in a kind of working class, borderline, lower middle class neighborhood, mostly African American, not exclusively. And in my neighborhood growing up, there were two huge buildings two blocks from my house, Atlanta Federal Penitentiary and a GM plant. And by the time I was graduating from law school 20 years later, one of those buildings had closed down and the other had built an addition. And so I came to DC, I came to the public defender's office to fight that fight. And that brought me to be in court standing next to Brandon. I was asking the judge to put him on probation. I had a letter from a teacher, a letter from a counselor at his school. It was his first arrest. The letters attested to his character. His mother and his grandmother were there in court. They were in the front row of the courtroom. They had been there for every court hearing. They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor in the case was asking for him to be locked up. She wanted him to go to Oak Hill. Oak Hill was the name of DC's juvenile facility. 
And whatever it was officially and whatever they said on paper, in reality, it was a dungeon. It was a place with no functioning school, no functioning job training programs, drugs and violence were rampant. It was a place where always you, as a child, you left out worse than when you went in. And the judge that had to make the decision in the case, Judge Curtis Walker, and I changed his name. I changed the names of all of the judges and all of the lawyers and all of my clients. And I did that not to protect the judges and the lawyers because their privacy is not an issue. I did that to protect my clients because I didn't want anybody to be able to go back and even figure out what any case was even based on the names of the other participants. Well, Judge Walker, I'm actually speaking to tomorrow morning to DC Superior Court judges, the whole group of them have, have, have invited me. and. I'm sure that when I tell the story of Judge Walker, they're all going to be trying to figure out who was Judge Walker. And the sad reality is it could have been more than one of them. So Judge Walker is looking out in the courtroom, and he's an African-American judge. He's the prosecutor, the juvenile prosecutor is African-American. Defense lawyer is African-American. Brandon's African-American. That's not unusual. If you go to D.C. Superior Court, look at who's charged with a crime, you would think that there's no white people who lived in D.C. And he looks at Brandon and he says, son, Mr. Foreman's been telling me that you've had a tough life, that you deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. The judge had been a child in those years, so he proceeds to lecture Brandon on what that was like. And he says, so here's the thing. People fought, people marched, people died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you, he said. And he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on and embarrassing your family and embarrassing your community. No, that was not his dream at all. So he said, I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope you do turn it around. But right now, today, in this courtroom, actions have consequences, and your consequences is okay. And he locked him up. And I was so frustrated. I was so angry that day. I mean, the judge had taken the same history that motivated me to become a public defender, that same civil rights movement that I was invoking as my reason to be there in court, and flipping it on its head and using it as a justification to lock up my client. But as I sort of pushed forward and started to work through some of the anger, it's an ongoing process, as you can probably tell. I began, I began to reflect on the fact that, you know, the judge wasn't alone. 40% of the judges in Superior Court are African American, D.C. The city council that passed the gun and the drug laws that Brandon was sentenced under is a majority black city council. The mayor in the city was black at the time. The police chief was black. The police force was majority black. This is a majority African American city. 70% African American in 1970s, now down to just, just a tad over 50. The chief prosecutor in the city was none other than Eric Holder, who would go on to become United States Attorney General. And it seemed to me that even with all that representation, I told you that one in three young black men was under criminal justice supervision nationally, but in DC it was one in two. And so it felt to me like there was a complex story that needed to be told, that somebody needed to kind of dig down and try to figure out how it was that over the last 50 years as the United States embarked on this experiment in punitive criminal justice, the likes of which the world has never seen, and no country has ever tried to lock up such a high proportion of its citizens. How it was that so many in my own community kind of went along for the ride, were persuaded, were they compelled? What was the story? What was the story? How did this happen? How to make sense of this reality, this world that I was seeing? For those of you that are, you know, for students, sidebar, looking at the world and not understanding something is like a great way to start writing a paper, <laughs> like a great orientation to writing or a book. So how did it happen? Since the books are for sale, one option is we could stop now 
and everyone could go get their book and we could do my son is is in third grade he's eight years old they do in his class they do they do sustained silent reading where everybody they get the teacher gets out the books and they all have the books and, and it's a competition how long can the class go before anybody speaks and the thing is the kids haven't yet figured out that like if they just talk after 30 seconds they can like move on to gym so <laughs> it's like he comes home he's like dad we made it for 26 minutes today in sustained silent. so we could do sustained silent reading <laughs> But I'm thinking y'all probably want the highlights so you have exams and stuff coming up. So, so how did this come to be? How did it come to happen? So the first thing that we have to grapple with is rising crime and violence and the, and the fear that it generated in African-American communities throughout this 50-year period, but especially in the 1960s and then again in the 1980s, early 90s, the crack cocaine years being the 80s and 90s. But before then, before then in the 60s, Heroin. Heroin did to black communities in the 1960s what crack would do two decades later, although it's not as well remembered. So the homicide rate in the United States doubled in the 1960s. It tripled in Washington, D.C. in just 10 years. And heroin, which had been, all, been an issue, but heroin really exploded. So they test everybody entering the DC jail for substances. And in 1963, they concluded that 4% of the people entering the DC jail were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% have become 45%. In just six years, that's an epidemic. And it wasn't just the numbers, but it was also the response that those realities generated in the community. So to write the book, one of the things I did is I went to local archives. A lot of the retired elected officials have donated their papers to local government, to local libraries, uh, mostly university libraries. So a lot of the DC council retired. They gave over their papers and in a number of cases they turned over not just their official files but also all the letters that they received from citizens. So there's this amazing kind of documentary social history that's available. And what you see in these letters are, are, so this is mostly black citizens writing to mostly black elected officials. The city is 70% African American and 11 out of 13 of the first city council is African American. And their letters are saying, people are saying things like, I don't know what's happened to us as a community. I don't feel, I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I feel like a stranger on my own streets. I can't walk my I can't walk my kid to school because they're selling drugs on the corner and I don't want them to see that. I can't leave them in the school after park because they're shooting in the park. And over and over again you hear, do something, do something. You have to do something about it. Now who's receiving these letters? That's the second big argument in the book. Because the people that are receiving these letters are the first generation of black elected officials to hold office in any number in the history of the United States, with the exception of a few years during Reconstruction. This is a generation, right? There's an 800% increase in African-American elected officials in the 1970s and early 1980s after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the decline of formal Jim Crow. So this is a generation, many of them are from the South, a bunch of them were in the Civil Rights Movement. All of them remember the long history of under enforcement and under protection of the law in black communities. I mean, my dad used to talk about this and then I did the research and I saw it. He said, you know, we didn't used to call the police in Mississippi in the 1940s, 1950s. You didn't call the police about crime in a black neighborhood. It wasn't gonna, they weren't gonna come. And if they came, the only thing you'd be sure of is that they were gonna make matters worse. So they knew what Southern sheriffs, not just in the South, but especially in the South, in cahoots with the Klan, they said they asked about homicide in a black neighborhood. They said, that's not homicide. That's just another dead black person. And they didn't use the words black person. So they know this history, right? They're formed by this history. They're shaped by this history. Now they come into office. And they're bound and determined to make the law respond to those letter writers, those people that I'm describing to you that are pleading for protection who never would have even bothered to write a letter under Jim Crow. They never wouldn't have expected a response from government. But now they did, and this generation was, many of them were motivated to provide it. 
Yeah. Okay. So crime is rising. There's a reason to be worried and scared. There's a, a, in many ways, a racial justice or even a civil rights motivation to provide protection. But why police and prisons? Why is that the method of protection? And here's where this book, which is fundamentally tries to be a book about with African-American characters front and central. Right? You read this book and it's a book of black legislators, black politicians, black police chiefs, black mayors, black citizen activists. But at the same time, it's also a book about the constraints and the limitations that they were under. So it's both a book about choices that African-American leaders and citizens made and a book about their inability to choose at the same time. So what are some of those constraints? One of them is historical, right? The generation that I'm writing about, this is a generation of elected officials that's been elected to represent communities that because of a history of racism, because of a history of slavery, because of a history of Jim Crow, because of a history of redlining, where the United States government would not give loans to black neighborhoods, because of a history of decisions like where to put the federal highways. In the 1950s, 1960s, they built high federal highways throughout the United States, and they had to put them somewhere, through cities. Well, which neighborhoods did they pick to blow up and destroy when they had to run a highway through the middle of a city. Overwhelmingly, it was African-American neighborhoods. In my own hometown of Atlanta, Auburn Avenue, they used to call it the Black Wall Street. 19, if you've ever driven through Atlanta, Georgia, you have driven on I-75, I-85, and you drive on 14 lanes now. And you drive directly through the heart of what had been Auburn Avenue, a neighborhood that in many ways still has not recovered. So that's, his, that's a historical constraint, right? Institutionalized and structural racism and all the ways it manifests itself in public policy. Then there's a political constraint. So the people that I'm writing about are local officials. That's where African-American political power has always been concentrated. And, and in the United States, there's a lot, local officials have a lot of power and a lot of say over many, many matters. And part of the argument of the book is that local policy, local politics matters more than we give it credit for when we focus you know, exclusively on the federal government. But it's also true that local decision makers, there's, there are limitations to their power. And you see those limitations over and over again. So what you see basically is for 50 years, African-American political leadership having what I call this all of the above strategy to fighting crime and violence. They want more money for police and more money for prosecutors. And sometimes they even say we want more prisons. But they also say we want money for housing, we want money for education, we want money for job training, we want money for social programs, we want money, we want national gun control. We're passing local gun control measures in anywhere we can get them, in D.C., in Chicago, in New York. But they're going to Congress and saying, look, we know that these citywide gun control measures aren't going to do it by themselves. We need national gun control. They go to Congress and they say, we want a Marshall Plan for urban America. We want the United States government to do for its black communities, its cities, what the United States government did for Europe after World War II. Rebuild, reinvest, revitalize. So for 50 years, they go and they ask for money for all of the above. And they keep coming back for 50 years with money for one of the above. And the one of the above is law enforcement. It's police, it's prosecutors, it's prisons. So that's the second constraint. And the last constraint is one that still, I think, we limits us to this day. And that's constraint of imagination. So there's a lot of examples of this, but, but one of them that I'll raise is a guy named David Clark. So I mentioned that there were uh, 13 original home rule city council members in D.C., 11 African American. David Clark was one of the two white members. And he, had an, he, he went to Howard Law School. 
he worked with Dr. King, he became a lawyer for poor people, and then in the early 1970s he runs and he wins. And he's not a drug warrior. In fact, the first thing that he does in 1965 is he tries to get the city council to pass a law decriminalizing marijuana in D.C. in 1975. It almost passes. It doesn't. But it almost passes. But I say that just to say that he's not a drug warrior. So a few years later, he's the chief of the city council chair. And heroin, which had kind of stepped back in the 70s, is now back in force in the early 80s. And Clark is getting all of these letters from citizens saying things like, there's an addict on my stoop, they're nodding off on the corner, there, there are dirty syringes in my backyard. Do something, do something, you gotta do something about it. Now, Clark is a responsible elected official. He takes all these letters from citizens, he forwards them to the head of the relevant government agency. He then gets a letter back saying, Councilmember Clark, we received your citizen complaint. And he then takes that package of letters and sends it to the citizens so that they know that he's acted on their letter. So who does this non-drug warrior send the letters to? Remember, the problem is an addict in public space, right? That's the underlying problem. Does he send it to the head of the Department of Public Welfare, Public Health? Department of Mental Health, Addiction Services, Social Work? No, no. He's not a drug warrior, but he's an American. He's constrained by his imagination. And like everybody else, he's bought into this idea that the solution to the problem of an addict in public space is law enforcement. He sends it to the police chief. And one of the arguments in my book is that when we tr figure out how mass incarceration came to be, that we have to look not just at pronouncements from the Oval Office, from the White House, but these individual decisions like which public agency to reach out to when citizens complain about a problem in public, uh, of addiction in public space. Those tiny decisions made across 50 years, across 50 states, across 3,000 counties, those are the bricks that built the prison nation that the United States has become. So that's the argument of the book in, in, in very broad strokes. Let me mention just, uh, let me talk about sort of responding kind of what to do now. And in, in when I'm speaking to you know, when I'm speaking to students in the U.S., I'll often talk about kind of particular kind of organizations or policy initi initiatives. If, if I'm speaking to employers, I want to talk to them about what they can do in their, I, I give talks to law firms and other things, so I'll talk to them about their employment practices when I talk to judges. I, I always try to talk to, I always try to for, you know, whatever audience I'm talking to have a, where I'm like, direct and concrete and things that they could do like starting tomorrow to respond to this. Of course, I'm not expecting y'all to do anything direct and concrete starting tomorrow to respond to the problem to your South. Um, if you were inclined to do that, there's one big problem that I'd love to get your help with. <laughs> um, but we're working on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. But let me, so let me talk about the last, let me talk at a little bit of a different level, of a little bit of a higher level of generality. And let me just talk about the sort of last chapter of the book, where I talk about this whole question of, and this came up in our lunch conversation that I had with some graduate students earlier today. But this whole question of kind of violent and nonviolent kind of and the criminal justice reform movement in this moment. So, you know, as somebody who spent most of my adult life working to create a fairer criminal system, I'm thrilled that there has been some momentum in recent years and some ways in which the conversation has changed. 
uh, more and more people raising their voices about this profound injustice that is our criminal system. And at the same time, one of my great frustrations is how much of that energy has been focused on just one category of individuals, what we call nonviolent offenders, which typically when people make that reference, they're talking about people who sell and use drugs. And that's great progress, because as you'll see from, you know, if you were reading some, I read a quote earlier today, there's seven quotes in the book where, you know, 20 years ago, if you said nonviolent drug offender, people thought you were crazy because the drugs and because people said, well, everybody that sells drugs is a violent offender because they're responsible for the violence there. So, so the movement, I think, deserves a lot of credit. And now I want to push further and say, okay, but let, let's go beyond that. And, you know, part of the problem is just a mathematical one, right? 20% of the people in prisons in the United States are there for drug offenses. So if we released every single one tonight, tomorrow morning, the United States would still have the largest prison system in the world. So it's not going to solve the problem. So who's there? Well, 50% of the people that are there for crimes that are considered under the U.S. statistical approach to this violent crimes. Now, most of those crimes are not what you, when I say violent crime, most people immediately think of murder and rape. The overwhelming majority, over 80% of the crimes that are identified as violent by the various different state and federal statutes that identify these things are things that, like robbery, burglary, breaking into a house and stealing property if it's a dwelling, possession of a gun, even if you don't use the gun, assault, where somebody else has been injured. And so we can and should, and, and, and I'm prepared to have a conversation too about uh, murder and rape, because I have thoughts about how we treat people convicted even of those very, very serious crimes. But for right now, I just wanna talk about the heartland, the majority of the people who are in prisons in the United States who, like I said, are convicted for these other offenses that are identified as violent, but are not the most serious ones that you think of. So if we were to actually tackle that group, that would make a big dent in the size of the prison system. And so it's a mathematical question, but it's also a, mor a moral question, I believe. And one of the, the stories that I tell in the book uh, towards the end, at the end, is of a young man that I represented by the name of Dante, and I'll, I'll I end by mentioning his story. Um, I started with his story, and 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 I should end. And, and one of the conversations that we were having earlier today was about narrative and the use of narrative and argument. So, so I'll end with the story as well. Dante was walking on. 14th Street in Washington, D.C. on a very, very cold by Washington, D.C. standards uh, night. Child's play compared to, I think, what's going on up here. <laughs> and he walked up to a man at a bus stop, and Dante had a knife in his pocket. And he said, give it up, give it up, or I'll cut you. And the man, both Dante and the man were African-American, the man takes money out of his pocket, $12, throws it on the ground, runs in the air, runs. Dante grabs the money, runs in the other direction. What Dante doesn't realize is that there's a security guard, or there's a customer at a store across the street seeing this, someone a security guard gives trace, security guards very fast, faster than Dante, catches him, and holds him for the police. And Dante promptly confesses. So he's got the $12 on him, which is the amount of money the man said he had lost. He had a knife on him. He's confessed. At the bottom of his confession, he says, I'm sorry. Tell the man I'm sorry. Now, I'd like to report to you about my legal brilliance. Like the movie version of this involves me filing some motion that upends the government's case or finding this witness that shows that Dante was framed. But in the real life of being a public defender, and this is just real life of how cases are, Dante many cases, Dante was guilty, he, the evidence was overwhelming, he was going to have to plead guilty. My job though was to try to put together a package to the judge to try to explain to the judge why something other than prison was the right sentence in this case. 
And that meant I had to turn into a social worker and investigate Dante's background. And as I began to do that, I found, as I did in so many of my cases, unimaginable you know, levels of pain and trauma. His mother was addicted to drugs. She was never got treatment. See our earlier conversation in a city that was investing money in law enforcement, but not in treatment. There was no treatment bed for her. There was only treatment beds for one in the 10 people who needed it. And she wasn't able to provide for him, and she basically left him unsupervised for hours, and, and he was raised on and by the streets in many ways. The school system never identified misread flags and never tested him for the special services that he should have gotten. And there were some bright spots. One of them was he was incredibly good with his hands. He had these, car these carvings that he would do um, that I saw in his room, and some of them were finished and some of them were half finished. He hadn't really gotten a lot of training, but he clearly had a lot of talent. And I would start calling programs in the city, trying to share his his promise and his potential and also his pain and 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 sell him to these alternative programs. And I would tell his whole story, what I just told you, but in greater detail. And at the end of it, they'd say, "And what's he going to plead guilty to?" And I would say, "Armed robbery." And they would say, "No, we don't. We don't take violent cases like that. We don't work with violent offenders." Of all of the categories of crimes that are in our prison, the largest single category is robbery. So this is the heartland, it's the heartland of our system. And they wouldn't take it. Dante's mother actually was the one, a couple weeks before sentencing, she found a program. It was an upstart, no letterhead, barely a track record, but it was a pastor at Southeast DC, storefront church that had started this alternative program and he was willing to take a chance. He, was, he, he took Dante, he accepted him. Okay, that's all well and good, but y'all know court, getting into a program, that's a start, but you still gotta convince the judge. And the judge in this case was none other than our friend Judge Walker, who had sentenced Brandon. Now Brandon had not robbed anybody, and he had gone to prison. So the chances of the judge putting Dante in a program seem very low to me. But you fight. That's what you do. You advocate. You try. People deserve someone to try for them, even with long odds. My only hope that I saw was to try to go and talk to the man that Dante had robbed. And it wasn't uh, that likely to succeed. Because when you knock on the door and you say, I um, represent the person that robbed you, a lot of people are like, yeah, okay, cool, like, next, <laughs> lock the door on you. But Mr. Thomas, uh, I call him, he, he, let, he let me in and he heard me out. I told him the story, I told him Dante's story, I made my pitch. And at the end of it, he said, I asked him if he'd go along with this program. At the end, he said he had to think about it. He let me know in court. So it was a couple, two weeks between then and the court hearing. And I had a bunch of cases, but I thought about Dante's case almost every day. And on the day of the court hearing, I walk, go to the hallway, and I walk down the hallway, and I see Mr. Thomas sitting right outside the courtroom. He's wearing his dark suit. And before I could even say anything to him, he, he holds out these two, his fist with two pieces of paper, crumpled paper. I look at it. And I knew these. I had given him these papers. One of them was Dante's confession that he had... I told you that he had given on the night of, and I wanted Mr. Thomas to see that because I wanted him to know that Dante had apologized at the same night before he even had a lawyer telling him this would be beneficial to him. And also, he had a more formal apology letter that, he, that Dante had written with my assistance. And Mr. Thomas said, you, you asked me to forgive your client. He said, I can't do that. He said, but I am trying, and I can go along with the program. So we'll hu I, we hustled, I hustled in the court, I got that case called as fast as I could before he changed his mind. The prosecutor was pissed, the judge was surprised, but the judge went along with it, and he put him in the program. And ever since that day, I've always thought, you know, what if we tried to think about our criminal justice system the way that Mr. Thomas thought about that case? You know, what if we, we 
Because to me, what Mr. Thomas was saying and understanding is that justice requires accountability, but it doesn't require vengeance. To me, he was saying that, you know, equal protection of the law, right? Go back to the beginning of the story. Mr. Thomas is one of those victims of crime who this generation of elected officials that I'm talking about was motivated to protect. Like the DC criminal justice system was ramped up to protect an African-American laborer like Mr. Thomas, who never would have gotten even a hearing in court 50 years ago. But now what we were offering him and we were saying we were gonna protect you by giving a long prison sentence to the person that robbed you, but Mr. Thomas was able to see and say that justice does require protection, but it doesn't necessarily require the longest possible prison sentence and the harshest possible conditions. And so I feel like to make that more of a reality, right, that does require policy changes. It requires funding public defender's offices, right, because the only way you're going to get somebody that's going to be able to investigate and tell your story is if public defenders are adequately funded, which most are not in the United States. It means getting rid of mandatory minimums, because unless you get rid of mandatory minimums, judges don't have the discretion to give individualized sentencing regardless of the background. But it's not just policy, it's also no, also personal choices, right? Because if you think about it, it was Mr. Thomas's personal choice, his individual choice, to be willing to try to forgive, not to forgive, to try to forgive. And it was Pastor Gaffney, he, he, when he started the program for struggling teens, so get, sorry, the, the, the pastor's name was Gaffney, who started that program that Dante's mom found. When he started that program, he made an individual choice to extend it, to not have a limitation that all the government-run programs that I was calling had, but to extend it to include people who had committed violent offenses, not to turn anyone away based on the category of the offense. That was an individual choice that he made. And so sometimes, you know, when I talk about that case, you know, people say, well, you know, we know why we get the argument for being compassionate in Dante's case, but that's because you told, that's because we know his story. And what I always feel like in response to that is, well, yeah, but, but everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. I just happened to tell you Dante. It's the label, it's things like violent offender, armed robber. Those are the things that once we attach that label to the person, they shut off our ability to hear the story. There's no story to be investigated once the label has been attached. That was over 10 years ago, the sentencing, and I lost track of Dante. That's what happens as a public defender. You actually, the system, one of the perversities of the system is that the only people that anybody in the system learns about are the people that don't succeed because they get rearrested. And it's actually one of the things that drives harshness, especially for judges and prosecutors and probate, but let's put that to one side. I lost track of him and a couple of years ago I was walking down the street in DC, I was walking past the metro, the subway system in DC and I heard it was a there was this construction site. You were supposed to cross the street, I didn't. Uh, and I heard that I'm glad I didn't. I heard this voice and it's Mr. Foreman and I looked up and it took me a while because it had been a while, but it was Dante. He was up on this beam and he had a hard hat on and he came down, he was filled out, he would become a man, and he had a goatee, and I wanted to have a long conversation with him because the one of the things as a public defender is you crave these moments of connections with your clients that have gone on to do okay. But of course, from Dante's standpoint, first of all, he was at work. Second of all, I reminded him of a low point in his life, of a point of powerlessness in his life. So he kept it short, but he gave me the basic outlines, which was, the program, he said the program was hard. The pastor almost kicked him out a couple times, but he made it through. He got his GED. He got part-time work and eventually full-time work on the construction crew. And he had a seven-year-old son who he was raising in a way that he had not himself been raised, the kind of a care and attention that he had not received. 
And he'd never been rearrested. And just before we were partying, I said, you know, that I didn't want to go into the whole thing and bring up his case, but I did say, you know, I, I do think about Mr. Thomas and, and the choice that he made, uh, you know, to, to try to forgive. And he said, me too, me too. And he went back to work. Let's talk.